ओके लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन नमस्ते गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून गुड इवनिंग वेर एवर यू आर बेस्ड ऑन दैट वेलकम टू दिस अमेजिंग प्लेटफॉर्म दिस वॉज सपोज टू बी फिजिकल हरासिस इंडिया मीट विच वॉज टू हैपन इन वियतनाम बट एज वी ऑल नो दैट ड्यू टू दिस pandemic and uh, the the uh, situation that we are all into uh, this is happening virtually and let me first uh, compliment horasis and cii uh, for uh, this wonderful initiative uh, the partnership between cii and horasis is is going on since last 5 uh, years now and there have been uh, various initiatives that they have taken together jointly to promote india and i am happy that this time around we are having this session on india's diaspora and engaging that diaspora in the post covid future uh, welcome to uh, to the session uh, welcome uh, my uh, panelists uh, coming from uh, different parts of the world from from united states from singapore from indonesia and also from from thailand uh, we have i'm sure uh, attendees also attending it from uh, various corners of the world uh, as as the diaspora is spread across uh, probably 125 countries as i know the the uh, statistic says that uh, the diaspora is now spread across 125 countries and the number is is 18 million population and that 18 million population is 6.4% of the total global migrant population So it's a significant, the largest single diaspora uh, in the world today. Uh, a combined net worth of 1.5 trillion US dollars. Uh, these these figures are are really uh, not just uh, encouraging but phenomenal. Uh, combined net worth of Indian diaspora is today 1.5 trillion US dollars, and which, by the way, is is almost I would say little short, but almost nearing the current uh, uh, india gdp uh, so that's that's the strength and that's the power that the indian diaspora today uh, holds uh, and uh, by most of the metrics indian diaspora is counted as the most materially successful and immigrant ethnic groups in the many host countries they are the most educated and prosperous diaspora together they are single biggest remittance group sending almost 80 billion dollars back home to india in the year 2018 so that's the the strength that's the power of course uh, i i i can't stop myself from uh, identifying some of the biggest stars of the diaspora who are well known back home in india uh, starting from vinod kosla to sundar pichai to indira nyogi uh, banker anshu jain uh, and late astronaut kalpana chawla srita william narinder singh kampani manu prakash hindu jaj deepak jain and so on and so forth but these have been uh, the the names that we have heard uh, in the past or we have heard them uh, over the years uh, but uh, we we can't uh, you know forget the the new generation diaspora which is making news across the world and some of them are represented by you here uh, on on this panel uh, the upcoming uh, stars include uh, mathematician manjul bhargava anjali sood ceo of memco uh, neel kothari of federal reserve bank of minneapolis uh, then you have uh, divya suryadeva cfo of general motors uh, we have uh, bimal shah who is chairman of bidco in in kenya uh, we have uh, lakshman narsimhan uh, uh, who's who's uh, with the, the racket back in city in london uh, the pharma company then you have uh, suresh kumar of walmart Uh, and so on and so forth and not to forget dr vivek lal of lockheed martin uh, i mean these are some of the names that make us proud uh, and 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 i'm glad that uh, you belong to that uh, community you belong to that category of people uh, who who make uh, people in india uh, proud always uh, in the us uh, 8% of the founders of the high tech companies are indians uh no wonder uh, india is, is indians are seen as 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 the leading uh, tech giants or, or, or techies in the world uh, 8% of of the founders of the high tech companies in the united states are are indians 
yes we started with uh, the terms like uh, non resident indians or, or migrant indians uh, to uh, ocis overseas indians and now uh, all of them are are clubbed under one category and that is called as people of indian origin uh, the reason why they are now called as people of indian origin is because uh, we have a certain geography certain countries uh, especially what are typically known as uh, girimutia countries uh uh the the, uh, the south africa the pg suriname kayana uh you know so on so, so on and so forth uh where uh, now the uh, indian diaspora is there for almost uh, three to four generations and the fifth generation is is all almost there uh, because the first uh, i'm told the the immigrant or the migrant from india uh, went uh, went somewhere uh, in the year 1830 so between 1830 to uh, 1930 there was huge uh, number of people who who moved from india to uh, these countries uh, for various reasons and therefore now we are seeing fifth generation also uh, of of these uh, uh, indians who were settled uh, in in south africa and wanting to uh, play their role in india therefore they are now called as people of indian origin of course we all know that uh the people of indian origin or or the diaspora as as it is known globally uh, gained attention and recognition uh, only in the year 2003 when the government of india uh, initiated and started pravasi bharatiya divas uh, during the the uh, late prime minister atal bihari vajpayee's government and ever since then this has been the flagship event of government of india uh, which is held biennially so every alternate year we have the pravasi bharatiya divas and which which has really uh, resulted in in government of india or the public at large understanding and appreciating the role and and uh, recognizing recognizing the diaspora success uh, with the huge success of course uh, of of uh, the events in in times square audi modi or wembley uh, stadium and so on and so forth in the recent past uh, with honorable prime minister addressing Uh, i mean gatherings which probably no other world leader has seen uh, in in those countries uh, i think uh, there is even further more acknowledgement and recognition of diaspora's achievements uh, uh, and 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 i think some of these uh, countries i mean their governments are officially on record that without the uh, the diaspora indian diaspora uh, who's who's heavily engaged in activities in their countries uh there's some of their infrastructures or some of their service sectors would collapse whether it is the uh, the united kingdom or whether it is the uh, uae or uh, other countries in the middle east or or west asia as we call them so i think this is this is the the background uh, of of this particular session and recognizing this uh, identifying this strength of diaspora which i mentioned about in terms of the dollar economy or in terms of the strength uh, ministry of external affairs has set up a, a economic relations wing you know this economic relations wing job is primarily to engage with diaspora and the countries that uh, they are currently residing in into the uh, the the engagement which is more sustainable and which is more on the economic agenda so today's bilateral talks that the 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 india has with various countries has a large section of economic agenda which was not the case in the past you know it used to be a typical diplomatic or a very very goody goody uh, exchange that used to take place but today uh, economic agenda is is on the forefront economic agenda is 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 on the topmost priority for all bilateral uh, discussions that uh, that the government of india is engaging with a uh, commerce ministry has set up a, a, a single point of contact or i would say a help desk which is called pio help desk under invest india invest india is is a forum or a platform which is again an example of ppp public private partnership that is uh, happening in the country and india has developed this platform for facilitating diaspora's engagement uh, with the with the country i think uh, initiatives by indian council for cultural relations uh, then uh, things like uh, what we cel- uh, just celebrated yesterday international yoga day uh, also have contributed to recognizing uh, contributions by 
uh, Indians across the world. Of course, the uh, Solar Energy Alliance is another major initiative that government has taken. So I think this is to create opportunities and avenues for engagement for much talented and passionate diaspora to engage with the country. I will close my initial opening remarks with, with just a couple of major uh, uh, high points and that is uh, uh, what diaspora uh, can look forward to or what India is looking forward to from diaspora is, is, is an effort in improving the infrastructure, the overall infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, it is across the board, whether it is health, physical infrastructure uh, and, and so on and so forth. The second is 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 improving its governance which will lead to overall improvement in the living standards of of the millions uh, of the people uh, in this country so i think these are the two major sectors major opportunities in my opinion which will drive the engagement of of uh, diaspora with india of course we are going to be the youngest nation and we will continue to have that aspirational population which will always keep demanding better services 24% of world's energy consumption is likely to be here in India in, in a decade from now. And I think that is what is driving the Prime Minister's vision for Atma Nirbhar Bharat. With this, I will close my opening remarks and I will now request each one of you to share your views, your vision, and then we will take some of the questions. Uh, let me begin with uh, Vidushi. Uh, uh, because as we say, uh, always ladies first. So here you go, Vidushi. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Vidushi Bhattacharya, and I'm actually very excited to be here because uh, my parents actually moved back to India when I was a kid. And my parents, originally, they were from Joshua. And at partition, they moved over to Kolkata as refugees and had nothing. And then my dad left India to get his doctorate in Europe. And after we lived overseas and in the US for a while, we actually went back in the late 60s. Right. And we were there through the Bangladesh Independence War. And it was just you know not the best time to be there. So we came back. And I've always wanted to go back to India. I run a space technology education startup, and there are a number of things that I've been trying to do in Bangalore for a while. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk here at Harassus because I've been searching for a pathway to get India, particularly the youth, fully engaged in the space sector. So um, I do have a couple slides. Let me just put those up for you guys. I'm gonna share my screen. And okay, so now you should see the screen, right? I'm gonna just do my uh, slideshow here. While, All right. Can, while can, while we are getting the screen, Bidushi, if, with your permission, yeah. uh, I welcome Venkatesh. Uh, so Venkatesh, we started uh, at twelve thirty. We uh, good to see you on on. on no, the I was hearing it all along. I just uh, uh, I just you guys didn't see me, but I could hear you all. So please continue. All right. Well, welcome. All right. So what I really want to talk about is the um, solutions that we can uniquely get from outer space, particularly in the context of the post COVID world. And what I really want to do is think about leveraging the space sector for the citizens of planet Earth. And this involves not just the government side, but also the commercial side. So India has been uh, part of the space technology sector for a long time. As a matter of fact, rockets, which are a very big part of India's um, global space tech footprint, were started. There was a big rocket sector in India back in the 1300s. There was a, they were used in warfare. There's a book by Koshik Roy called Warfare in Pre-British India, which came out in 2015. And interestingly, there's a type of ancient rocket called a Mysore rocket. Tipu Sultan actually fought the British East India Company in 1789. You can see here, this is a painting that somebody did of that bottle, battle. And um, he was very innovative and used uh, different kind of tubes to store propellant. And these rockets were able to actually go two kilometers in range, which is um, pretty far. So if we move from that to all the things that are happening right now in space, it's a very big year for commercial space. Um, I like this image here in particular. This is the Mangalyaan mission that went to the moon. Um, this particular spacecraft has been in orbit working fully since the year 2014. And this is actually an image of the planet Mars that was taken in 2014. We've had a number of commercial successes this year. SpaceX and NASA just 
uh, a couple of weeks ago did a collaborative launch of some astronauts. There's a lot of interest in that. And we've got another commercial company in New Zealand that's launched and we have IoT that's going to be provided and internet that's going to be provided on a global basis to people regardless of whether they're near a city or not through satellites. And SpaceX is launching this big set of satellites um, and over the next course of the next few years. Um, July is a big month to go to space because the uh, distance between the Earth and uh, Mars is um, very ideal if you launch in mid-July. So the UAE is sending up their first spacecraft directly to Mars. They're not going to try for the moon. They're going directly to Mars. And NASA is launching as well. And then in late 2020, China's Changi um, Lunar Sample Return Mission is also going to be la launching. So, of course, my favorite movie of all time right now is Mission Mungal. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's quite inspirational. And I think it's really fun. To um, further inspire you, let me first say we have not gone to Mars. Before anybody starts sending me email and saying, oh, well, how can I get to Mars? Who's been there? This is just me doing a good job with Photoshop. But I really want you to think about where we can go and where India has the technology and the talent to take us in the coming years. And we're now in a new era where we're not just sending up spacecraft to be able to prove that it works. We're not just in a tech demo phase. We've actually moved over to commercial solutions. So um, stuff like this, your phone connects with space thousands of times a week through GPS. You, all of your location services come from space. And you might say, well, that's very well and good. We have our phones and we're thinking about doing all this very expensive science up there. And why should I be spending money on this? So I have a very easy job in that I have to sell you on something that's very inspirational, but I also have some challenges because I need to convince you why we need to involve space technology in the day-to-day -day lives of people, particularly in the post-COVID sector. So this is actually my um, last slide, and this is where I really want to put a focus and offer some possible what paths that we can take in the future. Um, if you can take space technology, along with ground-based technology and social solutions and look at economic solutions, you can provide a lot of answers because you're taking in a unique advantage of the, event, the, the point of view from space. And a good example of that right now is food security. Um, with the, the pandemic, people with the world over have had issues getting just basic supplies. And I know there's a separate um, session going on on supply chains, but um, one of the things that you can do from space that you can't do from anywhere else is you can look at a broad swath um, of the earth and you can look at anything from supply chains looking tracking ships or tracking trucks that are taking cargo from one place to another but you can also look at the health of crops and you think about these um, small farmers who actually have to rent trucks to get their crops to market at this point 40 percent of crops actually just spoil before they get to market. Imagine giving a farmer a cell phone with data on when we know that their crops will actually mature so that they can schedule that truck in a timely fashion and get their crops where they need to be. That's just one of the really amazing ways in which I think we can put together space technology with ground-based solutions. Um, just a couple other examples are natural disasters where you can go in and you can predict where fires are gonna start using infrared cameras. Another really cool example is when we had those earthquakes in Nepal a few years ago, um, they were able to use satellites to go in and identify villages that had completely been cut off because of the earthquake. And once they identified where those villages were, they were able to send in airplanes to drop to, um, to drop up emergency supplies. Construction, you can look at encroachment. You can look at um, whether the construction is coming near any sort of zones where it shouldn't be. And of course, I did mention um, space-based internet um, as another option, as another thing we can do in the future. The, the main point of all this is I think we have experience overseas in doing some things in very exciting areas. In my case, you know, NASA, everybody wants to work for some kind of a space company in India, it seems. I get emails at least a couple times a week from young people. What I would love to see is some kind of think tank where we go in and we directly address so, uh, problems that are affecting not just India, but just the globe. So food security would be one where we bring in space tech, where we bring in... Um, 
ag tech and, and a lot of other um, a lot of other sectors to be able to provide these solutions. So um, I, I hope that I've convinced you that space technology is not just a gee whiz kind of a thing where we look up at the sky and feel inspired, which is great. I hope you can see that it provides a very specific set of solutions to help us in the uh, post COVID world. And with that, I will actually just hand it back. So let me just stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Vidushi. And I yep. think I think we in India we have experienced how the space technology uh, with uh, the ground solution that you mentioned uh, has helped. I mean, both these uh, uh, cyclones during the pandemic, whether it is Amphan or or Nisarg on on east coast and west coast, uh, we could manage uh, and we could limit the uh, damages to minimum yes. and uh, actually no loss of life just because we had the prior in information and we could move the machinery and the ground uh, infrastructure accordingly. Yeah. So thank you very much for the wonderful, uh, uh, you know, observations and, and opportunities. Uh, let me turn over to uh, Sunil Golecha. Sunil uh, is in, in Singapore. Over to you, Sunil. Thanks, Atul. Uh, my name is Sunil Golecha. I'm uh, CFO for uh, the Asia region for Thomson Reuters. I've lived in the US, UK, Switzerland, and various other parts before. You're not audible, Sunil. Sorry, can you hear me? You, you need to unmute possibly. Can you hear me now? Yep. I think the others can hear me. Oh, he disappeared. Okay. I guess I'll continue and Atul, let, let me know. Um, yeah. yeah, first of all, thanks for the opportunity for sharing my views. Uh, this is a topic which is, I guess, quite close to me and I'm really passionate about how I can personally engage uh, as a diaspora uh, in the nation building activities and to improve our overall development agenda. Um, from my perspective, India's engagement with the diaspora, I think Atul alluded to this earlier, is primarily focused on economic investments uh, and more recently on uh, India's brand ambassadorship uh, abroad, right? So with events like Howdy Modi and so on. Uh, beyond viewing the diaspora as just a source of, I guess, financial capital uh, and brand ambassadors, I really think the government needs to view them as human capital and tap into the talent and the expertise that we bring uh, to help solve various socioeconomic problems back home. Uh, besides information technology, which is, I guess, the usual area which everyone, uh, I guess, looks at, the diaspora consists of some of our foremost uh, global experts, not just uh, country experts and thought leaders in areas, be it education, healthcare, banking, financial services, even law and agriculture in some areas, and science and technology. Uh, and these are all people who are thriving in, uh, I guess, their respective areas. And we also have people in public sector and civil services in various countries who are shaping government policies and decisions. Uh, many of them are keen to contribute to India's development and nation building efforts. But the problem is, uh, I'm not sure if everyone actually has an easy way to engage or even know where to start really uh, in terms of how to engage. So Atul mentioned Invest India, again, great uh, to know that there is a platform for people of Indian origin to actually reach out to a helpline uh, if they want to invest. On a similar manner, what I would really recommend is maybe there is a talent exchange or a talent marketplace uh, where people who want to contribute can actually identify how they can engage and how they can, I guess, get involved in uh, various activities which are critical for India's growth. Uh, again, even, even if you somehow manage to cross the hurdle of identifying information, the challenge people usually face is they often end up in confusion and frustration because the policies are not clear, there's red tape, various procedural and operational hurdles and roadblocks. Uh, so again, the government needs to, I guess, basically identify a way to engage people uh, in both discovery of opportunity as well as facilitation of their engagement. Uh, again, with regards to discovery specifically, how can uh, a diaspora member identify uh, where is the demand for their skills, right? So maybe there is a public forum or a marketplace where specific socioeconomic challenges or priority issues are highlighted. And it could even be a specific job, job board where you publicize here are key roles that we are hiring for to solve business problems. A couple of things that come to mind, like Air India uh, losing thousands of crores every year. Uh, BSNL, I think, lost 40,000 40, crores in nine months. So how can people uh, who are operational experts in those industries engage and try to help India solve those problems. Again, there are various other problems at the grassroots level, uh, be it with, I guess, 
uh, labor reforms, land reforms, and so on. We, there are various things pointed out in other forums uh, where, where we need to, uh, I guess, address some fundamental challenges. Now, with COVID specifically, I think there's likely to be a wave of reverse migration, uh, similar to what we saw post uh, dot com as well as the 9-11 crisis and so on. Uh, and again, there are various geopolitical and socioeconomic factors for that. Uh, many of the returning Indians are probably likely to stay in India uh, for the medium to long term uh, because there are some systemic issues they will be facing uh, in, in the new world. What is going to be important is for India to actually come up with a proactive engagement strategy for rehabilitation and reintegration of these talented individuals into the Indian society, right? And again, there's specific areas where they could actually contribute and there needs to be a mechanism for providing them easier access to capital, infrastructure, uh, speeding up regulatory clearances if they want to set up startups, uh, eliminating any hurdles and so on, right? So those would really create jobs and help India actually come out of this uh, crisis much stronger. Um, so th those are, I guess, my opening remarks in terms of, uh, I guess, three specific areas where, again, India can engage people in a more, uh, I guess, scalable fashion would be not just at the strategic level. So we have had some instances where people from, uh, I, I guess, certain fields have been uh, inducted as board members on certain, uh, I guess, companies and so on. But it has not been very systemic. The second area where we actually need to drive into is operational excellence. So how can we actually bring people who run companies in these specialty fields to come in and run some of our PSUs or some of our educational institutions and our research and our R&D departments and so on. And finally, more broad engagement with the uh, diaspora would be on actually as consumers, because as the diaspora, we are actually consuming a lot of services. Uh, for example, I buy airline tickets, I buy uh, I guess train tickets on IRCTC for my parents when they're traveling, pay utility bills from here, buy insurance, do banking and so on. Uh, I have a lot of insights to share uh, on how exactly those, do, those services work in various other countries, right? And how can we improve that overall customer experience? And I'm sure many of us uh, have the same challenges and we face the same issues. So I think engaging those individuals uh, in also providing a better user experience and insights would be critical for India to grow and thrive. So I'll, I'll stop there. I know there are a few others to, uh, I guess, talk to. Uh, so Atul, I'm happy to answer any further questions later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, uh, let me quick. Uh, we speak to us from uh, from Bay Area uh, in the United States. Over to Gio. Yeah, thank you, Atulji. Um, thank you first to Harasses India, and especially Frank Jurgen for inviting me to share my thoughts. Um, my name is Gio Marikin, and I run a consortium of startups uh, who have an integrated joint venture, and we focus on and scale uh, digital transformations. So we perform work all over the world, including in India, and we span multiple sectors, including clients in the industrial energy sector, healthcare, vertical farming, athletics, politics, governance, uh, along with a keen focus on social impact. So for me, there is no better time uh, for the collective unification and execution of scaled solutions by the Indian diaspora. But in order uh, to properly and successfully engage the Indian diaspora, we need to execute what I term as the five R's. So number one, revive digital India specifically addressing the digital divide when it comes to the infrastructure needed to support the digital growth, uh, even in geographic areas that are not strong today. So uh, a, a robust uh, digital infrastructure, um, create the internet access for all, even rural areas. Number two, ramp up manufacturing India. The indelible mark that China leaves, whether warranted or not, in uh, what we deem post-COVID-19 is the door opening for India to step in as a preeminent plus one manufacturing powerhouse. 
This again requires both strategic and tactical infrastructure initiatives to increase business accessibility, free movement of goods and labor with very supportive policies and governance. Three, responsibly globalize Pharma India. Uh, this is another area where India can become a solution globally, especially in the race to find a, a vaccine uh, and then um, for post-COVID-19 at a global scale. But adhering to strict regulatory oversight is paramount in this process, as the responsibility to cure must be at the forefront, not profits alone. So number four uh, brings us to realize fintech India. This area becomes crucial for all of the above uh, to work and materialize in the most efficient way. India can lead the global comeback from the post-COVID-19 economic dip and the emerging fintech firms can take global leading positions around the world with the best of the firms. Then five, uh, regrow rural India. India was once all about farming and the power of Kisan, the farmer. This is a valuable asset we cannot lose, but just like all things, it needs to be updated and adapted. Technology should not, again, should not be the lead in smart farming. Rather, farmers should be the lead uh, with their innate instinct and infused technology to make farming smarter. Taking this approach, we can bring equity to all parts of India and not trample the livelihood of millions and make India a powerhouse for food production for the world. And for all of these to be realized, we need to have a resolute vision and equally aligned policymaking from the governing bodies that are aligned both nationally and at state levels. But in undertaking this process, we need to be extremely cautious of the lessons from the ginormous, and some may say irresponsible growth of China and not to trample Mother India, the environment, and the earth in the process. So I'd like to place this mental picture in your minds right now. Um, from the year 2000 till now, we witnessed China grow up from an adolescent, maybe prematurely into an adult on the world stage and suffer some enormous growth issues for the world to watch. And during the same time frame, if we were witnessing India grow up from an adolescent, to a sprightly teen, this coming decade will be the opportunity for the world to watch us turn into a responsible adult superpower on the world stage. The Indian diaspora is vast and in every corner of this world and in every industry. It is time for us to rejoin hands and work together. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Gio, for, for those uh, specific uh, observations and four R's that, that you referred to. Uh, revive, ramp up, responsible, and realize uh, the opportunity. Uh, now, let me quickly move on to the uh, youngest member on our panel and probably who represents the, the next generation uh, uh, diaspora members uh, across the globe, uh, Aditya Rayan. Over to you, Aditya. Right. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Atul and distinguished speaker on the panel. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to speak on this global event. It's an honor for me to speak on behalf of my generation, the millennials on this panel. I wish I can bring a little bit insight about how my generation see this topic. So uh, my name is Aditya Arian and I'm the CEO of Fires Digital Indonesia. It's a marketing uh, technology consulting company that provides solution for small medium enterprises. I also found an NGO uh, called Pemimpin ID. It's a leader of Indonesia, so which concern about leadership development in Indonesia. So today I'm going to talk about how COVID-19 is actually uh, can be the catalyst of collaboration of the young in Indian diasporas around the world through activism, technology, and creativity. So uh, as we know, uh, Mr. Atul said that India is the leading country of origin international, of country of origin of international migrant today with more than 18 million diasporas according to the United Nations. 47, 40, sorry, I'm sorry, 74% uh, of them at a 
at their working age, and 75 of it is dominated by millennials and Generation Z. So it's between uh, 20 to 34. Indian diaspora so also considered as uh, one of the most successful immigrants in the world, like uh, Sundar, Pichar, uh, Sundar Pichai and uh, Satya Nadella, Microsoft, Google. And many of them are the inspirational figures for us, the younger generation who aspire to be successful and influential in the future. But we are kind of different in many ways. And in many ways, compared to uh, the previous generation, like um, millennials and Generation Z believe that it is equally important for companies to take part in the social issues and create meaningful works. Aside from striving to make profits, we tend to choose pricier products from companies for their belief rather than just functional things. We are an everyday change maker. Uh, we are an agile utopist that are dreaming about our ideal world and taking collective action to make it happen with our own hand. So in short, we love activism. Uh, the young generation love activism and we love doing good things. And second, uh, we are also the student of the Internet University who learn and share and uh, more from our smartphones and laptop than our own university. So we also call digital natives, 24 hours, seven days, nonstop connected all over social media and chatting apps and doing all the things from it, from uh, finding out how to make good food, how to fix broken laptop, uh, to organizing hundreds of people movements and doing good things. So this trait, those two traits, the ability to adapt and the, and the ability to use technology to the maximum level is uh, or, or makes us believe that we can do anything from anywhere with anyone. So I think the collaboration is the new currency today. So uh, during this uh, COVID-19 health crisis in the past three or four months, there are so many remote collaboration in many industries. Uh, for example, my company uh, can manage like a million dollar value advertising campaigns by not even going out of home. Just at home and we can manage all the things like movies are well made, music are composed, events are held at the home. Although there are contraction in economic sector, but somehow I believe that this generation is able to keep alive. I believe the young Indian diasporas, the millennials and the generation Z is one of the key stakeholders in this topic. So uh, based on my experience, I would like to call uh, all the audience, all the uh, viewers of this uh, conference, uh, then asking what if we are the young and the successful Indian diaspora around the world can contribute to each other, can, so, I mean, sorry, can collaborate to each other, can make something from anywhere you live. What if we don't have to go to India physically, but we can help them to rebound in the post-COVID era. So uh, it can be anything. Uh, Mr. Sunil uh, said that um, we need specific sector, but I believe that it can be anything in activism. It can be social movement, it can be donation, it can be social enterprise, it can be any open project in any field, any industry, personal level, group level, or even connected multi-stakeholders for bigger impact. Everything is possible uh, with activism, with technology, and with creativity. So uh, to sum up, uh, I believe that uh, government, private companies, universities, and NGO, and influential figures have to start acknowledging the importance of young diaspora by first making clear impact, I mean, making clear public campaign calling for their help with clear social cause and objective. Second, facilitate the network for them to connect each other. And third, nurture any initiative that come up from them. It also a win-win because from my perspective and maybe from my generation, it always a big yes to contribute to home and make something bigger than ourselves, especially for the nation. And then uh, to sum up, I believe that acknowledging and involving young diasporas through technology and creativity, India 
can recover faster and better than we can imagine. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Aditya. And, and just to uh, give you one input, uh, acknowledging and realizing this uh, growing young Indian diaspora, uh, since the last two PBD events, the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India has started organizing youth PBD, you know, which is a uh, special event and one day exercise for engaging uh, the millennium generation that you spoke and you represent. Right. My apologies, uh, Shailesh. Uh, I, I probably jumped the queue and uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I would now request you to please uh, share your views and ideas uh, on the topic. Uh, over to Shailesh uh, Puswami from, from Thailand. Over to you, Shailesh. Thank you. Thank you, Atul. Thanks to Frank and Horisis for letting us have a chance and meet lovely people on the panelists and everybody out there. Uh, having only four minutes left, I think I'm going to have two minutes for questions and, and another two minutes. I'm going to try to, and, and, and I'm going to try to wrap. No, not, not just for you. I think even we have to get Venkatesh also on okay. that. Okay, but at least with this time. So please proceed. Yes. So I'll try to wrap this up in a yes. minute. So, so basically, uh, I'm from Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand. We run a family business here out of Thailand. And uh, we've been having a lot of ties with, with, with India doing joint ventures and being a family business in real estate, wellness and uh, industries. So I, I agree with a lot of points with my panelists here that three things that we, need, we, that, that we need to do is talent, talent, engagement, and collab collaboration. I think these three things are very important for, for us young. I, I, I put myself as young because I think I'm in the millennium coming to the older age. So getting the, the Indian diaspora into these three things, engaging them how, I think, now with this post-COVID and all, I think the Zoom, the technology is all there. So it's very easy for them. And trying to get the talent, the talent is out there already. So, so we don't really have to focus too much on the talent. It's just channeling the, the talent to the right industries and the right categories. It can be anything. That that's also can be done very easy with this young diasporas out there. And collaboration. It's getting the industries, getting the, the big boys getting those collaborations on the table with, with us, with good talent, collaboration, getting a clear objective. And I think the policies and everything will follow once we entrepreneurs push the industry forward. Because if we talk and wait for the government, say they have to have this and all that, things will never happen. I think it's, it's the entrepreneurs now, the post-COVID with the doctors, the nurses, they did all their jobs. They did their job. They did a great job helping everybody. Now it's the entrepreneurs that have to get up on their feet and push this economy back, back into the into the moving back again. Because we can just all sit down there and cry and complain. Our sales have gone down fifty percent, but I believe it's the MDs, the chairmen, the CEOs, all out there to to sit down and then get the talent, get the engagement, get us back into collaboration to push this. Uh, to push this thing in. So that's just my one minute pitch. And uh, we are open. I mean, we're open. We have Atul that has great associations and the trust. I just want to add the trust. Once we get the trust through the associations, we can definitely move things, move things at a faster pace with, with the young. And they want purpose. They want, they want social compliance. They want this social impact and they want a purpose. I see Aditya shaking his head like, yes, yes. That's what we want. They don't want the bureaucracy and all that stuff, the red tape and all that stuff. So we have to know what our, our customers want, what these young people want, and we have to push yeah. them forward. Uh, sorry to interview. And uh, oh, over yeah. to you, Venkatesh. I, I'm not going to take any time. Over to you, Venkatesh. You know, Atul, you had mentioned something about 5% of the startups, to say, in, in U.S. have Indian uh, founders. Let me just share in my time what I have. Uh, you know, how how dominant uh, India's, uh, India's situation is. Do you guys see, uh, can you see my, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we are able to see. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So, so this is, uh, this is just one s s snapshot 
of how dominant is the Indians are in Silicon Valley. You all have heard of Google, Microsoft, and IBM CEOs being Indian, but it's not just them. It's Micron, Adobe, Workday. So out of the top 10 technology companies in the world, six of them have Indian CEOs. Uh, and you know you can look at the technologies uh, IPOs, but look at on the right hand side. If you look at most prolific acquirers in Silicon Valley, more than 60% of the companies they have acquired have Indian founders. And this is just Silicon Valley. Uh, what has happened is that across Fortune 500, the, there are the, the hundreds of Indians who are, you know, who have positions as CTO, CIO, or CFO. There are at least 100 of them. And I think... Uh, and I think if if there is imagination, these are the people you see who are incredibly influential in their companies. Now, with the imperative to move the supply chain out of uh, you know into India, I think this is a this is a huge opportunity for India to uh, to leverage the goodwill and the talent you see of all these people who you know who want to help India. So I think uh, I think I'll just rest rest my case there. It's 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 a it's a huge huge uh, reservoir of goodwill that exists in corporate America. Yeah. Okay. I I think uh, we've had a wonderful session. Although uh, the last two speakers, I'm sorry. I apologize on behalf of everyone uh, that uh, uh, you couldn't get uh, sufficient time. But I think you made your points very clear, and and those points are like uh, talent is is there in abundance everywhere. I think it it came out very very clearly and and as as clear as it can get that there is talent amongst the uh, diaspora, the PIOs anywhere in the world. All that we need to do is we need to see uh, how can we uh, ensure that engagement happens with uh, their, their uh, country uh, homeland uh, uh, back here in India. Uh, and, and of course, the other point which Aditya and others, uh, Salish, you also mentioned, how can we ensure the collaboration within PIOs in different geographies, different countries? Because I think that is one area which, which I think uh, today no work has been done. Uh, that uh, how can we collaborate amongst each other with each other uh, because unfortunately that data information sharing is not happening at any platform and i think that's that's one takeaway for me um, uh, here in, in in india and also someone who works with the government of india that how can we uh, create that database how can we create a platform which enables uh, indian diaspora to uh, interact communicate uh, engage with each other uh, wherever they are uh, with that, uh, let me thank you all. Uh, we we haven't seen any any uh, major questions here, but of course there were uh, I think offline one-on-one you know, -on -one interactions that some people wanted to have with Aditya and others. Uh, I think they have replied to each other. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, gentlemen and a lady, uh, for your excellent presentations and also the the specific uh, pointers how uh, the diaspora can improve. Uh, its engagement with uh, India. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, thank you. and and we'll certainly see uh, for the benefit for the benefit of uh, everyone uh, on the panel. I think we have had close to eighty three uh, people watching us. So just uh, for your information, thank you.